Hello, I'm Kirsty Young, and this program was originally broadcast in 1964, and some people may find the language used unacceptable by today's standards. Each week, a well-known person is asked the question, if you were to be cast away alone on a desert island, which eight gramophone records would you choose to have with you? As usual, the castaway is introduced by Roy Plumley. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? Our castaway this week is an American actress who was a star of the London stage at the age of 21. Paying one of her rare visits to Britain is Tallulah Bankhead. Now, Miss Bankhead, the uh, first... Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. We had an agreement prior to going on the air that you would call me Tallulah. Otherwise, you don't like me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I do like you, and Tallulah. Thank you, First Roy. question, could you endure loneliness for a long time? Well, uh, if I could have so many more records and so many more books, food and drink from time to time, you know, I think I could. Uh, no, I don't think I could because I love bridge and poker. And no poker games, no. No. Then I'd be very lonely, say. <laughs> For some slight consolation, what would you be happiest to have got away from? I don't really, I don't, I haven't thought of such a thing. Uh, uh, oh, I know mice. Mice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We promise there'll be no mice on this desert. Island. Okay. <laughs> Is music important in your life? It's half of my life. Have you studied it? Do you play an instrument? Well, as a child, I played the violin and the piano. But the moment I went on the stage, I was uh, stupid and didn't keep up my practicing, you know. Do you play records a lot? Well, I listen mostly. You see, in America, we have... TV 24 hours a day yes. and radio 24 hours a day and you get all the records there and so I, I listen mostly to the records on radio. Yes. Now you've chosen these eight records to take to this desert island. Did you have any plan in choosing them? No, no plan. You didn't give me time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could choose many, many more but I'm only allowed eight. Yes. And I'm not necessarily naming them in order. I love them all the same but mm. for different reasons. Yes. What's but, the first one you have on the pile? Then? Well, I think the first one is Louis Armstrong, Satchmo to us. I've chosen his on the sunny side of the street. Whenever I come into a nightclub or a restaurant wherever he's playing, he always starts whatever he's playing and starts the song for me.
Rosso singing Vesti La Giuba from I Pagliacci. Now, you were born in the South, were you not? Yes, I was. Whereabouts? I was born in Huntsville, Alabama. Your father was a congressman who became speaker in the House of Representatives. That's right. What's the origin, Tallulah, of your unusual and, and very beautiful Christian name? Well, thank you. My great-grandfather went from Greenville, South Carolina to Alabama to look over this property he'd acquired. And he passed through Georgia, where Tallulah Falls is, which is mm -hmm. 80 feet taller than Niagara Falls. Is it? And uh, he wrote back to my great-grandmother and said, if I have first child is a girl, I want to be called Tallulah. Mm -hmm. after these beautiful falls. And my Aunt Marine, she's a great uh, uh, authority on Indian folklore, and she told me that Tallulah meant love maiden. Then I went to a luncheon at the Women's Club in Atlanta, and only the first time a lot of a man has ever been present. And he said, we all know that Tallulah means terrible. <laughs> well, that was an awful <laughs> shock after love maiden. <laughs> but she's terribly attractive and terribly this and all those bromides, you know. And uh, she was the goddess of vengeance that once a year a prince of the tribe was sacrificed over the falls for the good of the crops and the rain. Mm -hmm. And then this came out in the papers and I got this letter from this Irish poet saying that Tallulah was first inhabited by an Irish contingent and that Tallulah in the 6th century was an Irish saint. When I going from love maiden, terrible and saint, then I met these two divine people from Israeli and they told me that Tallulah means rock or precipice, which was the only place that when the people of the Jewish faith were being put upon, the one place they could go to that no one could reach them. Yes. So uh, there's the four stories I know. Take my choice. Yes. You can take your choice. <laughs> right. What inspired you to become an actress? Well, inspired is hardly the word, because I'm so lazy. <laughs> I should have never gone on the stage, but I can't make a living any other way. Did you see a lot of theater when you were a child? No, because I lived in a small town, but I sent my picture to a beauty contest that was run by Picture Play magazine. And you were a winner. So that's how it all began. That took you to New York? That took me to New York, yes. What was your first professional engagement? <laughs> well, my first professional engagement was just nothing, a walk-on saying not a word. And I left out for three days because I was so humiliated. I, then the next part was a leading part in 39 East where I played, understudy, but was first played, uh, and was to play the f month of August when the star took a vacation, and then I was to tour the national tour. Yes. And then I got uh, appendicitis. So you lost the part? Well, I didn't. I said, I yes. can't. I, I said, I couldn't do the dance. I had to dance in it. Quite soon after this, you came to London. What brought you here? Well, Charles Cochran came to a party, and they asked me to do imitations. I used to... I got to these parties because I sang for my supper, you know. Yes. And so I did these. And, and uh, he said I should go to England, and he sent back a photograph of me uh, to Sir Gerald Moyer. And they said, come over. And, uh, of course, I was so thrilled I could hardly bear it, you know. And so I got the Labour Department and I opened the Gerald and everything's under control. Yes, well, the kind of impact you made in London in the 20s was roughly akin to the impact the Beatles made last year. You, you <laughs> had the, the gallery girls queuing up to mob you outside the theatre and you really did hit London. Good yes, and, and they were darling, but I think they annoyed people because they would scream and yell, to live a year wonderful before I'd done anything. You were uh, in London for eight years. How many plays did you do here <coughs> at that time? Oh, darling, I did The Green Hat. And Michael I did Owen. A Cardboard Lover with Lady Howard. I did uh, That Is Big Air, another play by Rachel Crowes who wrote the first play I was in. Uh, Noel uh, Card's Fallen Angels. Fallen Angels, of course. The Gold I, Diggers. You, you know these. Why ask me? <laughs> I don't remember the things I've done. I've done so many. It's and it's Lady of Camellias. Yes. Was the Nigel Playfair period. It was written in uh, 1840. Mm. The most exquisite costumes I had. Yeah. And they had to have nurses in the theatre because people fainted and cried when I died. It was very complimentary. It said that you and Steve Donahue were the two most consistently newsworthy people of the 20s in London. Everything <laughs> you did was headline news. <laughs> You were also rumored to be one of the wild ones, or, or so the papers said. One of the said. wild ones? Yes. Well, I wouldn't contradict if anyone said that. <laughs> Let's have record, your third record now, Tallulah. What are you having next? My third record is Frank Sinatra's My Funny Valentine. Because I think 
It's one of the most divine records. My funny Valentine, sweet comic Valentine, you make me smile with my heart. Your looks are laughable, unphotographable, yet you're my favorite work of art. Is your figure less than Greek? Is your mouth a little weak when you open it to speak? Are you smart? But don't change your hair for me Not if you care for me Stay, little Valentine, stay Each day is Valentine Frank Sinatra singing My Funny Valentine. Now, after your eight years in London, in the London theatre, you went to Hollywood and made about, what, half a dozen pictures? Mm -hmm. Perhaps the best remembered, I think, The Devil in the Deep with Charles Lawton and Gary Cooper. Well, so Cary Grant played a small part. Did he? Mm -hmm. He played one of the uh, naval officers, you know. Mm -hmm. um, how long did you stay in Hollywood? I stayed there a year because the first three pictures I made in New York. Yes. Did you enjoy it? Nope. You didn't like the movie? Nope. No. I cannot stand semi-tropical weather. I cannot stand it. So you said goodbye oh. to Hollywood and went and tackled the Broadway theater after having made this big that's, success in that's London. That's right. How did you do? Well, I didn't make out so well until I did uh, my first real great hit. I was uh, The Little Foxy. Lillian Hellman. Was it? Lillian Hellman, yes. yes. Yes, this was a big She's success. She's a great writer. And then you followed that with a very difficult part in Thornton Wilder's Skin of Our Teeth. Oh, well, the author, the most divine man, Thornton Wilder, is his third Pulitzer Prize. He got it for The Bridge of San Luis Rey, for Our Town, and for that. Mm -hmm. And I got the Critics Award, and that is I did in Lifeboat. Lifeboat followed that, didn't oh, it? Oh, yes, that it, followed that. That was the Hitchcock picture. You went back to Hollywood. Yes, yes. That must have been rather a miserable film to make, sitting in that lifeboat day after Not day. Not at all, it was divine, because Hitchcock is so divine. They gave me a senior dog, and every Saturday night, you know, I dined with him and his wife, Alma, and Patricia, his daughter. They were darling. And, uh, no, I was very happy with that. Yes. Then back to Broadway for The Eagle Has Two Heads. That was a <coughs> No, No, then after that I did with Lubitsch, The Royal Scandal. Here it was called The Tsarina. Ah, yes, I'd forgotten that one. And then back to Broadway. Mm -hmm. The Eagle Has Two Heads. And a very successful... I wish I knew as much about my career as you do. <laughs> the Eagle Has Two Heads, yes. And Private Lives. Yes, four years with that. You were doing a lot of radio at this time, and you brought your radio show over here for one sensation. Yes, program. the big show. We had an hour and a half every Sunday... And you were over again in 1957 to appear in Cabaret. Yes. Have you done a lot of Cabaret? Well, I I, uh, uh, I did Las Vegas. Mm. And what's the purpose of this visit to Lulu? What have you come over for this time? <coughs> well, here I've come over to a little film called Fanatic. Yes, and I, I gather you play the title role. In oh, Nasty, you would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, you're wrong because I play a religious fanatic and I have every regard and admiration and respect for anyone's faith and creed. I can hardly call myself a religious fanatic. What's your next record, number four? Uh, Walter Houston, September Song. And what was so touching about this uh, this uh, record, which got just raves of all time, is because he was a rather old man, and he, he's not a great singer. But the uh, the feeling and the knowledge that, of him singing it, it was one of the tops of all time. <laughs> When I was a young man courting the girls, I played me a waiting game. 
If a maid refused me with tossing curls, I'd let the old earth take a couple of whirls while I plied her with tears in place of pearls. And as time came around, she came my way. As time came around, she came. But it's a long, long while from May to December and the days grow short when you reach September and the autumn weather turns the leaves to flame and I haven't got time for the waiting game and the days turn to gold as they grow few September November and these few golden days I'd share with you these golden I'd share with you And the wine dwindles down To a precious brew September November And these few vintage years I'd share with you these vintage years I'd share with you. Walter Houston singing September Song. To Lula, in your autobiography, you wrote that you hated acting. Is this really true? Well, I shouldn't say that. I Like, I don't like crowds, but I love them in the theater, you know. <laughs> No, I'm lazy, darling. You know, I don't like doing anything. I'm the type that I never stand up if I can sit down, I never sit down if I can lie down, you know. Now, you've been working hard on the film here in London. Have you had a chance to see some old friends? I've only seen a few because I get up at 5.30. Yes. We break at 10 to 6, and by the time I've changed and, you know, um, everything. So you haven't had a chance to see any theatre while you've been here? No. How about coming back to do a play? Well, darling, and I don't want to be vulgar, sorry, but I couldn't afford to do a play here with my upkeep in America mm -hmm. and everything here, you know, I'd be losing money. Mm -hmm. Have you any one big ambition professionally, any, any part that you no, want to play? No, no. Just to retire. <laughs> I can't believe that. Let's have record number five. What next? Number five, darling, is one of the greatest of all time. It's Billie Holiday who everyone calls Lady Day. She's a great Negro singer. And uh, Strange Fruit is taken from a famous book by a, um, a southerner. And Strange Fruit hanging from the trees. It's about a lynching, really, which is pretty frightening. But I think it's most moving. Southern trees bear a strange fruit. Blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. Then the sun 
sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck. singing Strange Fruit. What's your next choice, Tallulah? Well, I put them together because they're the top. And they're wonderful, quite different. Ella Fitzgerald, Love for Sale by Cole Porter. I think anything that Ella Fitzgerald does is okay with me. But you will see the difference in Billy Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald. Gerald singing Love for Sale. Tallulah, how good a Robinson Crusoe would you be? Could you look after yourself on a desert island? I couldn't. I can't even put a key in a door, darling. I can't do a thing for myself. Now, if you found yourself in possession of some kind of craft, if a raft was washed up or something of the sort, would you try to escape or would you sit it out on the island? Oh, I'd sit anything out and escape. You'd rather sit it out? Well, I could escape. float sitting up practically, but I, I had a swimming pool, like an Olympic pool, but I don't think I ever got to the end of it. I'm too lazy to try and swim. You'd have a raft. Oh, I'd have a raft, but I wouldn't know how to work it. <laughs> you just let it drift. I can't even row a boat or a punt or something. I, well, I can float away. Mm -hmm. I think we'd better stick to music. What's, what's your next choice? Well, the next choice is the greatest of all time. It's Flagstad and Wagner's Tristan and his order, the Liebesjoke. Why do you choose this? I had the honor of knowing her. I was in Chicago and she came back and gave this benefit to some charity after the war. And uh, I happened to be there. She got 1,000 curtain calls. She had the greatest voice of that type in the world.
Kirsten Flagstad singing the Liebestod from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. What's your last choice, Tallulah? Well, this seems kind of obvious, but uh, I love it dearly. I heard it for years. It was played every night. Uh, on a certain program, it played four hours, seven nights a week, called um, the Happiness Exchange. It was to get money for all kinds of people who needed it. It ended up always with Perry Como singing with the choir, The Lord's Prayer. I think it's very beautiful. Mm. Como and the male voices of the Robert Shaw Chorale singing the Lord's Prayer. There are your eight records, Tallulah. If you could only have one of them, which would it be? I would take all eight and a thousand or more, and that's all you're going to get out of me about that. <laughs> How can I pick out with these divine people my favorite? I had a gardener once, and I had the most beautiful flowers. And I said, what, what is your favorite flower, Louis? He said, I don't have any favorites. If I had a favorite, the others wouldn't come up for me, you see. So I don't want to miss any of these. And one object to take with you, of no practical use, one inanimate object. And the first uh, real possession I ever had was a painting of me by the greatest portrait painter, I think, in the world, Augustus John, mm -hmm. painted me. And uh, I would take that, not because it's of me, I was just a model, it was his great art. And I remember a great friend of mine and a very fine producer, he, he said to Lula, I always knew you had a soul, but it took Augustus John to let the world know it, you know. <laughs> and one book to take with you, apart from the Bible and Shakespeare. Well, I would take a book which was given me by the most wonderful man, great actor, great author, got two Pulitzer Prizes, great director of his own plays. I have had the honor of being in one called Reflected Glory. It's called The Human Situation by W. McNeil Dixon. And uh, I don't know quite how to describe it, except that one can 
pick it up and put it down, pick it up again in a month, a week or two weeks, or read it over again, and I'd have it in front of me here. A book of philosophy. And theosophy, in a way. Yes. Right. Well, thank you to Lula Bankhead for letting us hear your choice of Desert Island Discs. Thank you to Lula, you should say. Thank you, Lord Darling, and bless you all, dear hearts. Goodbye, everyone. guest in today's recorded program, first broadcast last Monday, was Tallulah Bankhead. The interviewer was Roy Plumley and the producer Monica Chapman. Next Monday at 1.10, the castaway will be Lavinia Young, matron of the Westminster Hospital.